Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jerry, and today we're going to talk about network cable types and network devices. So let's get into it by starting off with network cable types. Network cabling is a physical channel through which data communications travel. It's the connecting method between network hosts. We'll start by talking about a cable that most people are familiar with, coaxial. So coaxial network cabling is made up of four different components. At the center is the inner conductor typically made of a solid wire coated in either copper or silver. The transmissions on the network travel along this inner wire in the form of electrical signals. To protect the transmissions and prevent grounding, the wire is surrounded by an insulator that is usually made up of flexible PVC. Around the insulator is some sort of metallic shield, typically aluminum mesh. This metallic layer is used for grounding. To complete the cable, the entire assembly is coated with a plastic jacket. Understand that this is a generalization of how coaxial cables are constructed. There are several ways a coaxial cable can be made. For example, the insulation layer could be foam or even air. The cable could have two or more shield layers. The way a coaxial cable is constructed affects its transmission capabilities. This results in coaxial cables having different types or grades. The first type is RG59. The RG59 is constructed similarly to the generalized description. These types of cables are used for video transmission in CCTV systems. They were once used to transmit satellite and cable TV broadcasts. RG59 coaxial cables aren't used much anymore because they lose signal quality over long distances. So instead, almost all industries use the second type of cable you need to know about, and that's RG6. The RG6 coaxial cables are constructed with between one and four layers of shielding. In addition, the internal wire is typically made of a solid copper. The RG6 cables have much lower signal loss over long distances than RG59. The lower signal loss results in higher quality signal. This is why RG59 is quickly becoming replaced by RG6 cables. The RG6 coaxial cables are used for cable televisions, satellite televisions, and cable modems. The next type of cable we'll talk about is called twisted pair cabling. Now, twisted pair cabling is the most prolific network medium and the one that any IT technician or network technician will work with the most. The standard twisted pair cabling is composed of eight copper wires that are twisted into four pairs. The individual wires in twisted pair cabling are either 22 gauge or 24 gauge copper wire coated in plastic for insulation. The wires in twisted pair cabling are twisted into two pairs for a specific reason. Now, when an electric or electrical current passes through any kind of copper wire, an electromagnetic field is created around the wire. This is called electromagnetic interference or EMI. Now, EMI is emitted by the wires in a twisted pair cable, can be absorbed by, neighb by neighboring wires, resulting in a shadow signal that affects communication. So this effect is known as crosstalk. However, by twisting two cables together, the electromagnetic fields generated by each wire cancels each other out and greatly reduces crosstalk. In fact, the tighter the, wi the wire pairs are twisted, the more EMI is reduced. Now, EMI can come from a lot of different sources, not just the cable's wires. So because of this, Twisted pair cables come in two different types, and that's UTP and STP. Now, UTP stands for unshielded twisted pair. The internal wires are encased in only a plastic sheet. UTP cabling is cheap, but does not protect against external EMI at all. And as its name implies, STP cabling has additional shielding around the wire bundle to protect against EMI. Some STP cabling encases each wire pair in, uh, in foil shielding to further protect against EMI. And STP cabling is much more expensive than UTP cabling, but is necessary in some situations. 
So similar to coaxial cables, there are also different types of twisted pair cabling called categories. The twisted pair cabling's category defines several aspects of the cable, including its transmission specifications and intended use. So if you were to simply look at a twisted pair cable, it would be very hard to identify which category of cable it was, as they all look the same. However, almost all twisted pair cabling prints the category on the outer sheet of the cable. The word cat, short for category, is followed by a number. The twisted pair cabling categories range from one up to eight with variations in between. The most common categories of twisted pair are CAT5E, which stands for enhanced, and CAT6. The CAT5E supports speeds of up to one gigabit per second. It's able to do this because the wires are twisted much tighter than lower category uh, cables. This reduces crosstalk, and CAT6 cables support 10 gigabits per second transfer speeds and are typically used in high-speed network and broadband infrastructures. To connect twisted pair cables to devices, an RJ45 connector is used. The RJ45 connectors have eight pins that connect two of the four wire pairs in a cable. Another less common connector used with twisted pair cabling is the RJ11 connector. With only four pins, this connector looks like a miniature RJ45 connector. The RJ11 connectors are typically used with CAT1 twisted pair cabling, which is the cabling used for telephone communications. Both RJ11 and RJ45 connectors are attached to cables using a special crimping tool. There's a reason the majority of networks use twisted pair cabling for networks. The UTP twisted pair cables are very cheap. The twisted pair cabling is also very flexible, making it easy to work with. It also offers excellent transfer speeds with theoretical speeds of up to about 40 gigabits per second. However, twisted pair cabling sometimes isn't the best choice. So twisted pair cables are very susceptible to EMI. Many things generate EMI, including fluorescent lights, power lines, industrial equipment, uh, elevators, and the list goes on. Even when using STP uh, twisted pair cables, interference can be an issue. Another weakness with twisted pair cable has to do with security. Remember, twisted pair cables emit a small amount of EMI. This EMI can be picked up by special devices and used to eavesdrop on the communication. There's one more bound network medium that you need to be familiar with, and that's fiber optic. So fiber optic cabling is quite a bit different from coaxial or twisted pair. Instead of using electrical signals to transmit data, fiber optic cabling uses light pulses. The fiber optic cables are constructed with a central core that is made of either clear plastic or glass. The central core is able to carry light pulses along the wire. The surrounding the central core is a layer of cladding. The cladding has a reflective surface, which plays an important role. As light travels down the central core, some of it has a tendency to leak out. Now, the cladding reflects the stray light pulses and redirects them towards the center of the core. Around the cladding is usually one or two protective layers that help prevent the central core from getting broken or damaged. Everything is then surrounded by a plastic sheet. Now, fiber optic cabling comes in two different types. The first type is known as single mode fiber or SMF. The single mode fiber cables uh, transfer data using a single light ray. The internal core in these cables is often very small, about 10 microns in diameter. And this small core prevents the light from bouncing around too much, which allows for very long cable lengths and also high data transfer rates. The second type is known as multimode fiber or MMF. The multimode fiber cables have a larger internal core, about 50 to 100 microns. This larger core allows multiple rays of light to be sent along the cable at the same time. However, 
This also allows the light to bounce around a lot, which diffuses the light and reduces the maximum length of the cables. The fiber optic cabling has a lot of benefits over other network media that we've spoken about. So first, fiber optic cabling is extremely fast. It's the fastest type of network media. The fiber optic cabling is also immune to EMI. Because the transmission of medium is light, no EMI is emitted, and EMI from external sources do not affect the communications at all. This also makes eavesdropping impossible. Now, fiber optic cabling also has the longest transmission distances compared to other bound network media. However, fiber optic cabling is also very expensive compared to other types of network media. Fiber optic cabling isn't as flexible as twisted pair or coaxial cables. And if a fiber optic cable is bent too much, the internal core can break. In addition, the connectors on fiber optic cabling can't be easily installed. You need special training to be able to do so. And those are the different types of cables that are used in networks. So remember, different network media have different technical specifications and communication methods. They also have different advantages and disadvantages. And by knowing this information, you can then select the best network medium for any application. And that was network cable types. Now we're going to jump right into the next topic, which is network devices. Now, throughout your IT career, you'll deal with many different networks. The first step in understanding how they all operate is to have a firm grasp of the infrastructure that makes up a network. Now, we'll take a look at the different network hardware. So when we design a network, one of the first steps is to determine how the devices will connect. So we can physically connect the devices or use a wireless connection. So if you want to have wireless devices, we need to implement a wireless access point. Know that even with improvements in wireless networking, most networks still use a wired connection since it's faster and more secure. Let's now talk a bit about patch panels. So when you plug a computer into the wall port, you're connecting to the network switch, which can be in a different room or all the way across the building. On the back side of that wall port is another Ethernet cable that's been terminated at the port's connectors. That Ethernet cable is then run up the wall through the ceiling to wherever the network switch is located and then terminated at the patch panel. Now, each of the cables are punched down and terminated on the back side of the patch panel. On the front side of the patch panel are RJ45 ports. So we plug a small Ethernet cable into the appropriate port on the patch panel and connect that to the switch. This completes the connection between the client devices and the switch. So using a patch panel makes it easier to move devices around because the cable between the wall jack and the patch panel never moves. Now we usually keep our network router in a network closet. So the router is an advanced networking device that connects two networks together. When traffic needs to leave the internal network, it will always be sent to the router and then forwarded on to its destination. All external traffic flow through the router and we have a few options to how to connect our internal devices together. So first we have a hub. Now a hub is an older device that allows us to connect client devices together with ethernet cables. But the problem with using hubs is that when data comes in, the hub simply forwards the data onto all connected devices. It's up to the client devices to determine if the data is meant for them or not. If not, the client device is supposed to drop the data. Now, as you can imagine, this leads to a large amount of network traffic, which can cause collisions and data loss. This setup is also not very secure and makes intercepting data quite easy if an attacker can physically connect to the network. 
So to address these issues, we should instead use a network switch. Now switch also allows us to connect multiple client devices together using ethernet cables, but a switch can do much more. So when a device connects to it, the switch adds that device's MAC address to a table. So when packets come in, the switch reads the packet header to determine which device the data is meant for and then forwards it accordingly only to that device. Now this greatly reduces unnecessary network traffic and makes things a lot more secure. Now switches come in two varieties, that's managed and unmanaged. Now an unmanaged switch is a simple device that plugs in and just starts working. There are no extra configuration options available for these types of switches, and they work great in smaller network environments. Now for a larger network, you'll want to use a managed switch. Now a managed switch allows the administrator to log in and set advanced configuration options, such as setting up virtual LANs, monitoring network traffic, uh, quality of service features, and much more. Now, speaking of virtual LANs, let's take a look at what a virtual LAN is. Now a virtual LAN or VLAN, is a virtual network that's created on the switch. Basically, we can take specific switch ports and separate them into their own network. This allows us to create multiple subnetworks on a larger network. Using VLANs helps keep our networks organized and increases efficiency. Now we might also have a hardware firewall in our network closet as well. The firewall is responsible for monitoring all network traffic and blocking anything that's not allowed. A firewall can be configured to block data based on port or traffic type. But some network firewalls can also look at the, uh, the content in data packets and block traffic if malicious data is discovered. This is very useful and an option that you should always consider implementing. And that is all for today. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.